Okay, any questions before we get rolling? Okay, so as promised, oh, by the way, I plowed through, we'll see, I'm, I'm through two homeworks and I started on the third one. Uh, some of you that haven't gotten me the homework yet, I guess I can be forgiving, so just <laughs> get it to me when you can. Um, and I'll probably post another homework maybe later this week. Will that be the last one or? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see where the good one takes us. Um, so you're open for it. I'm open for it. <laughs> Uh, my stash bag. Perhaps yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, So uh, let me start with kind of clear up some misconceptions. Uh, suppose that I is an ideal. Suppose you have a, a proper uh, by proper. Uh, I mean, actually inside the ring, so it could be R itself. And there's an ideal, suppose that it's invertible, then there's a, also another ideal. So I is, let me call it an ordinary ideal, not just practical ideal. And there is it's J and R, also an ideal such that I J is principal. Uh, and in fact, actually, I didn't write it this way, but this is an infinite one yet. Uh, and let me, I, I will go ahead and make it kind of here. Actually, infinite one yet. Uh, and we might as well go through that exercise here. Um, oh, by the way, in grading some of your homeworks, too, here's an interesting factoid that some of you might know. How many of you have seen the, the, the proof that a Euclidean domain is a, a principal ideal domain using the Euclidean average? It's actually very constructive. It's, it's not very difficult. How many of you have seen in one form or another uh, or, or successfully proved that any P idea is a UFD? Right. And, you know, some of you in the homework, and I gave some latitude on this, some of you, in, in one of the homework two problems, it was like, um, R is a PID if and only if R is a UFD of dimension less than or equal to one. A lot of people said, oh, PID is UFD. Okay, so I get it. You guys have an algebra class of four. I need some latitude on that. Um, has anybody ever seen a proof without the axiom of choice? You have not. Even if you think you have it, you have not. Because in fact, you cannot prove that a principal ideal domain is a UFD without the action of choice. That's actually been proven. In fact, it's even worse than that. You cannot prove that a principal ideal domain has a maximum ideal without the action of choice, right? Because, for example, for some domains, you can prove there exists a maximum ideal. Let's see, you can demonstrate it, right? Or for a polynomial ring over a field of one variable, you can demonstrate it. But for a general PID, you cannot prove there exists a maximum ideal without the action of choice. Right, right, which I think is kind of interesting. So hidden in there, Euclidean to PID is actually fairly easy. PID to UFD actually requires choice, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so let's do this. Uh, so suppose I is invertible. Um, then I is invertible. I, I inverse equals R, where I inverse is the inverse we had defined previously. Uh, no, I inverse is fractional. So there is this A and R not zero, such that A I inverse is contained in R. 
um, hence, if J is equal to A I inverse R, then IJ is A R I R. Uh, and the other direction is very similar. Um, so suppose you've got some ideal and you multiply by another ideal, you get principal ideal. So suppose I inverse. Is equal to a inverse. Uh, okay. Um. Now, let me, let me point out one of the interesting things about all this business with verbal ideals. So let me do this example. Um, Um, well, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I'll do it like this. But I'll do this. Uh, R is not a good thing. Almost everybody's seen this example play when it's 5 times 6 times 2 times 3. And it's 1 plus 5 to the length of 5. Now, this is a dedicated domain because it is the interval closure of Z and the finite extension Q and join with square root of negative 5. Right? We've had that, uh, we've had the theorem earlier. So this is dedicated. So, here is a bad factorization of six. It's two times three, and it's one times radical negative five, one minus radical negative five. So this is a, a wonky factorization of, of six in terms of principal ideals. Uh, I can factor it this way, I can factor it this way. And in fact, all of these are maximal principal ideals in the sense these are all irreducible problems. How does that reconcile with the fact that ideals are supposed to uniquely. Well, it's kind of a cool little combinatorial thing. Let me uh, let me set up some ideals for you here. Let's see if I can remember them all. No. Let's look at this ideal here. The ideal generated by C1 equals radical number five. There might be some details all left out, but this is actually the proper ideal and it's not principal. Uh, because anything that divides this would have to have a norm. Four is in this ideal and, uh, and six is in this ideal. It may not be clear. Notice that um, notice this two is in here. Two, uh, negative two times radical five is in here. So when you add it to this, you get the conjugate, right? Two is actually kind of special here. So four is in this ideal and six is in this ideal. So if this were principal, there'd have to be an element of norm two, and there's not in this ring. Uh, let's let Q equal three. And I'm going to let Q bar notice. This ideal contains the conjugate of one plus radical negative five because the difference between this and the conjugate is a multiple of two. This one does not contain this 
and this ideal consumption in this. All right. These are sort of two concepts. Now, so let me point out a couple of things. Um, uh, if you square this ideal, it's generated by four. It's generated by two plus two radical negative five. And it's generated by uh, 94 plus 2 radical negative 5, which is the ideal generated by 2. Right? Certainly 2 contains this, and you can actually show that this ideal, this ideal contains the difference of these two, so it contains 6. So it's got 4 in there, it's got 6 in there, so it's got F2. Right? So when you square this, by the way, this of course means that P is a verbal ideal. There's no shocker there because it's a dedicated domain, so all ideas have to be invertible. What happens when you multiply these two here? This is three. This is nine. Three plus. Three radical negative five, three minus three radical negative five, and six. And notice this is the ideal number about three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we're going to devise this, and of course, you've got a nine and a six here. Well, let me point out um, a couple other things here. Uh, this, this actually happens to be principal as well. Let's see what we can get out of this P and Q. Let's generate by six. Uh, two plus two radical negative five. Uh, three plus three radical negative five. And then the product of these two, which is, and actually I'll, I wish I'd done it the other way. Let's do PQ bar. <laughs> I think that'll be easier for me. If I do PQ bar, I get six. I get two minus two radical negative five. I get uh, three plus three radical negative five, and I get six. Uh, not really clear the principle, is it? But it is. Anybody see what they're Hmm. Um. Let me verify this a little bit. First of all, it's clear that one minus uh, radical negative five divided six, right? Because of this equation right here. Got that. It's also clear it divided this one, right? Because of course it's two. Maybe not this one, it might be a little mysterious, but let's see. Now I feel like I'm in Miss Fassler's algebra class, right? Who's going to make me uh, rationalize this or smack me down if I don't? So let's not let me write down here. Let me see where I can get this out of your sticks here, correct? And this turns out to be. Well, actually, I'm going to pull a three out of this. Um, right. That's a plus. Well, 
which is, if I square this out, I get one plus two radical negative five minus five over two, which is minus two plus radical negative five. How about that? So this does divide this. So in other words, what we've shown really is this, we've got that containment. What about the other containment? Well, for the other containment, it suffices to show that you can get a one minus radical. Yes, one minus radical negative five here. Um, anybody see how to do it? Yeah, I think I do. Right, right. That's one way to do it. So, um, so basically, if I have uh, straight up, I have, yeah. So if I add, uh, or if I take negative this plus this, that gives me minus radical five. Negative this plus this is going to give me minus one. Right. So I don't know if I can do it. Negative this plus this. Negative this plus this gives me uh, right. Oh, when I said plus, yeah, negative this plus negative that gives me minus radical five. Negative this, negative that is minus five. But I've got an extra six I can throw in and add it to it, and then I get that. So I've got equality. Everybody. Anybody want to take a bold guess as to what this one is? Hmm. One way to see that, if you're a fan of Galois theory, is what you can do is uh, just treating the ideal almost like elements. Conjugate this again. Right? And this is P conjugate, Q conjugate, conjugate, Q for one uh, plus radical negative five. But the conjugate, conjugate of Q is Q, and the conjugate of Q is P itself. Because the ideal generated by two one plus radical negative five is the same ideal as two one minus radical five. So that's another way of seeing it. Now, here's I've got this all going on here. Here's what's going on in this element when I was back in the So I'm going to bring this down. If you look at the ideal driven by six, this is P, P, Q, Q bar. That is actually the prime ideal factorization of the ideal generated by six. And you can see this because two P's is a two and a Q Q bar is three. But rearranging these things different ways gives me different critical ideal factorizations. This one is two times three like that. But I could also write this as And this is one minus radical negative five, one plus radical negative five. Notice that the different principal ideals come from putting factorizations together that happen to give you principal ideals as well, right? And this is actually a very simple example. Uh, this is a simple class group, and I'll do one that's got a little bit more uh, meat on it. Uh, 
like you said. Uh, so let's sort through this and, and, and how to utilize this further. So here I'm going to define the class group. On the a domain uh, with quotient field K, we define I and VR the set of I. Such that I is a convertible ideal of R. Uh, let me caution you that what I mean by invertible ideal, this can be any fractional ideal, or any ideal that's invertible, fractional proper. And uh, I'm going to define print R to be. That of XR or X non zero elements. Uh, as you might guess, print R is uh, the principal, print being principal ideals. So, one of the big things that uh, I hope we remember is that every principal ideal is invertible. The, inver uh, the inverse of XR is X inverse R. Right? Notice, so this is actually a subgroup of I and VR. Because every principal ideal is invertible. Um, there's too much useless information floating around with all the principal ideals. And so uh, it's customary to define the class group um, So it's customary to just kind of squeeze all the principal ideals to zero, right? Just uh, in this quotient group, I I think principal ideals should all, should all be trivial, right? I'm going to make this the identity, uh, and the invertible ideals are not principal. Give me some kind of information about R. This is called the class. Uh, if yeah. the order of the class group is some n less than infinity, then the order of the class group and n is the class number. <coughs> And this is a favorite terminology that you will see like the number theory or things like this, the class number of R. By the way, in general, in general dedicated or general domain, there's no guarantee that uh, its class number is fine. However, if you like number theory and if you're looking at rings of algebraic integers, the class number is always, there, there's always a finite class number, which is actually kind of cool. Um, looking forward, so, in a certain sense, what does the class group do? It's measuring something. Um, and what it's measuring, so what does it mean for the class group to be critical? Well, it means that only the principal ideals are inverted. That's it, right? Okay, well, maybe that doesn't say a lot in general, but what if we look at a Dedekind domain? What does it mean for the class uh, group to be trivial? Well, 
Okay, again, it means that every invertible ideal is principal. But if it's Dedekind, every ideal is invertible. So it means that every ideal is principal, right? So that's actually kind of a, so in a certain sense, if you're if you're in the Dedekind domains, this is sort of measuring how far away you are from being a PID, right? That's that's basically what you're measuring, Dedekind domains. The bigger the class number, um, then loosely speaking, the further away you are from being a Dedekind domain. Now, in rings of algebraic integers, which is one of the places where the Dedekind domains are best, are, are best behaved, in rings of algebraic integers, the class group actually has two important properties. Um, and we'll talk about this later, but number one, the class group is always a finite group. And that's good, right? Because things are kind of under control. And number two, and this is a very important property, there is at least one prime ideal in every ideal class, right? So, for example, if your class group was, say, Z3, that means you've got the principal class, you've got the equivalence class called principal ideals, there's at least one prime ideal there. And then you've got the class of order three. You've got two classes of order three, and they're inverse to each other. Both of them have at least one prime ideal in there. And in fact, in rings of algebraic integers, what's true is every ideal class has infinitely many primes. Okay. Yes. Yes, guys. yes, for for rings of algebraic integers, in fact, uh, for some of the theorems I'm going to show you, all you need is one prime in every class. But rings of algebraic integers have as many as you want. And in fact, uh, in the Galois case, at least, they're really evenly distributed. Okay. Um, so let me uh, theorem five, five, three, four. Uh, let R be a dedicated domain. Uh, one R is a USD if and only if R is a PID if and only if CLR is a two if R has only finitely many amounts of ideals. Then R is an PID. And three. Every ideal of R can be generated by left side of these two elements. Uh, I'm going to actually, I'm probably going to throw in three in a second. Actually, three is a fun one. Uh, let me make some remarks about the sphere. Number one, actually, a dedicated domain. As uh, one and a half generator process. 
So you've probably never heard this phrase before, but what do I mean by the one and a half generator property? What that means is it's a little bit better than generating two elements in the following sense. You can pick one of your generators to essentially be almost anything, right? generator uh, can be chosen arbitrarily outside of this. <laughs> So in other words, if you have like infinitely many max line needles, then you you can choose the first generator, uh, first generator you've chosen in I. Of course, you better choose the generator you have to in the first place. Uh, but outside the Jacobson radical, if I remember, I'm gonna look up one and a half generator. I think that's right. You can choose the first one, uh, anything in I outside the Jacobson radical. So for example. If you have a ring of algebraic integers, and I give you an idea, you can choose any non zero element of that. And then the second generator must be chosen carefully, or, or more carefully than that. You can't just pick it uh, at random. And two, so here's the generalization of this statement at the end. If R is Cooper and the mutually from R, is equal to n, then each finite generated ideal can be generated by less than or equal to n plus one elements. So in fact, the statement holds. Uh, the statement holds not just for Dedekind domain, but for any one-dimensional proof of domain. Any finitely generated uh, ideal can be generated by less than or equal to n plus one element. Right. And I do mean like less than or equal to. Uh, so for example. Uh, let's look at what happens here with Dedekind domains. Dedekind domains are proof for domains, and they are one dimensional, correct? So that means that every finitely generated ideal of R can be generated by less than or equal to two elements, but every ideal is finitely generated. So all ideals can generate by less than or equal to two elements. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh, I'm only three as an exercise. Let me look at it. Two, one, and two. Um, one, uh, one and one, two. Uh, so obviously we kind of uh, notice that we have uh, two implies one, of course. Uh, one implies two, suppose R is a UFD. One-dimensional uh, UFD. Then R is a UFD. That's a homework problem that you do. Right, so uh, I guess I'm there. And in fact, uh, if you want kind of an outline of this, if you have a one dimensional UFD, uh, suppose you want to prove that it's a PID, all you have to do is prove that every time I do it, right? Because PIDs, uh, it's PID if and only if every prime ideal. So take your favorite prime ideal. Uh, P and R. Then there exists um, P, um, and this is not zero. There exists a non zero prime ideal, or prime, 
prime element, notice that the ideal generated by this is contained in B and must be as um, dimension of R is what's that? One. So these are non zero on my deal. And there you go, the top principle. Uh, two implies three. We want to show that if you have uh, PIDs and class members for the class of the true deal, uh, since R is Vedicum, every ideal is uh, invertible. And every ideal is principal. So I and V are is print R. So CLR and we'll see finally. Uh, if the class group is trivial, we want to show that R is U at V, and I'll just I'm not going to go through the choice again, but so in fact, I'm going to I'm going to show the stronger statement that it's PID, and then go back to that. So. Uh, Trivial means every invertible ideal is principal. But as R is Vedicum, all I are uh, invertible in principle. So R is a PID which provides R is And finally, we'll, we'll prove that second statement. It says if R has only finitely many maximum ideals in R is PID, of course the converse is not true, right? Because Z is a PID and it doesn't have only finitely many uh, maximum ideals. By the way, how, how will we prove them? Two? Uh, R is Vedicum. So all ideals, not zero, are invertible. Right. But R is also semi local. And what is true about an invertible ideal or a city local domain? All invertible ideals are principal. So all ideals are invertible, and all invertible ideals are principal, so all ideals are principal. And then R is There we go. Okay. 
All right. Um, C plus. Let me give you an example. I haven't shown you how to do this, so you're going to have to take this a little bit on, on faith for right now. But uh, it turns out that the class group of, oh, I'm sorry, minus five. The example that I just did, um, the class group of that is isomorphic to Z2. And that's, of course, the best kind of isomorphic to is when it's isomorphic to the identity, then it's the principal ideal domain. But this is sort of the smallest class group that you can get, right? And that actually means something special. So notice how I kept multiplying those ideals that weren't principal, and I kept getting principal ideals. What does it mean to have a class group Z2? Well, it means that, so writing this additively, you have the principal class. So you've got this big coset that consists of just all the principal ideals. And you have the non principal class. And these have things in it like two, comma, one plus radical negative five, and all those bad boys in there. Now, here's what's kind of cool. If you take, and this acts just like Z2 structure, if you multiply a principal ideal to the principal ideal, zero plus zero, you get zero, which is a principal ideal, no surprise. If you multiply a principal ideal to the non principal ideal, you get zero plus one, one, you get a non principal ideal. But the cool thing is, is if you take any two non principal ideals and multiply them, one plus one, you get a principal ideal in this structure. And in fact, th this is really cool because if I have two ideals that I know are non-principal, when I multiply them, they're guaranteed to be principal. That's how I knew that was going to happen. And it turns out that Z2 also gives you one more thing. Every uh, if. So it turns out this is a constant. If alpha one, alpha two, alpha n is beta one, beta m are irreducible factorizations, and these are elements, these are not ideals. So you have honest goodness elements, alphas and the betas are all irreducible. And if you have these two irreducible factorizations, then n and m are the same. Which is really kind of cool. I'm going to prove that later. Uh, let's kind of start off, at least, an example that's got a little bit more meat on the bones here. Here's something that's kind of up in the voltage here. It turns out, and if I don't get to it in this class, I certainly will in the Fall, if we can get to run that, uh, yeah, in the fall, if we can get to run that topics course, I'll show you for sure how to compute these. Um, consider Z is going to square root of negative 14. Um, no. R. Turns out the class number of this one is four. So I'm just going to tell you that without. Uh, Um, oh, let me also notice that. So, if you do, if you just take that statement at face value, that the class number is four, that means that the class group. What are my choices for the class group? We have two choices. It can either be cyclic or four, or it could be 
two elementary buildings, right? Like BC two some one of those two. Anybody uh, know which one it is? I want to actually, I want to give you a further clue. Uh, um, Silly idea. Uh, I've got this. I've got this problem here. And now, take me at face value here. Let's assume that I actually have. These things are in different ideal classes. Right? And actually, this obviously is a prime. Uh, this one's in the principal class, I know that much. Uh, how can I go about telling you what's what here? Well, Plus square root negative fourteen, and if it's principal, then if, if it's not principal, then we know something's be equal. That is correct. Right. The difference between Z two Z two and Z four is Z two Z two. Every non identity element is border two. Right. Do you see one up there that looks like it's a border two? Any of those square root principal idea? Three square root. Yeah, if I call this P, note that, um, so here's my computation in there. P squared is generated by 4, negative 14, and 2 right to negative 14. Um, is that right? Um, and this is the ideal generated by. Notice the two divides each of these, and two is certainly in there because we get the four and four. So this one's square the principal, so it tells me nothing. Now there's kind of a cheap way I can do this. Let's call this Q and Q bar. If I multiply these, I get nine, I get three. Minus square root minus 14. Or no, that would be three. My bad. Three minus uh, three radical negative 14. Three plus three radical negative 14. And then uh, 15. And this is the ideal generated by. Because three divides all this, and with the nine and the fifteen, I certainly get three. Two times nine minus sixteen. Yeah. Now, if you believe my statement that these are all in different ideal classes, this proves that it's actually Z four. And somebody tell me why? Why does that demonstrate that Z four? These are different ideal classes. D2 plus Z2, everything that is only a where here you've shown two different things are different. That is correct. If these are honest to goodness two different ideal classes, then uh, they can't be uh, inverses of each other unless it's Z4. Because in Z2, Z2, every non identity element has to be its own inverse. We've shown that these two are inverses of each other. Right? But the best way, as exactly what Jared said, is uh, take Q, or Q bar in this case, and square it. Right, and, and show that it's not principal. So that's kind of so. Here's kind of my 
fun stuff to do for next time. Number one, square this ideal and see if you can show that it's not principal. And number two, see if you can use these ideals to build the following factorizations of elements in Z adjoint with radical negative 14. Eight and one. Anybody factor that for me? Oh, you're too slow. Uh -huh. That's one way to do it. There's no exotic way. That was a little more time, right? All right, so that worked out to be eight one. See if you can use this stuff to show by putting the ideals together in different ways, like we did in the simpler Z of doing square and negative five. So you put them together one way. Factorization made one, you put it together one way with this. Another way to get this. Okay, any questions? Any questions? How about out there? Any questions? All right. Well, uh, y'all have a good one, and we will see you by Wednesday.